Hello, good morning or good afternoon or even good evening to those of you out there attending this Staffing Industry Analyst webinar, Five Leadership Disciplines You Need to Know to Successfully Grow Your Business. My name is Adrienne Nelson. I'm the Senior Director of Global Membership Products here at SIA, and I welcome you to this webinar sponsored by Advanced Partners. How do other staffing firms do it? What makes a company grow to 100 million or more? We're going to explore that in a few moments with our panel of experts. But in the meantime, let me give you, <clears throat> give you a few logistics to get you started. <clears throat> You're gonna be listening to this webinar through your computer speakers after you log in. We do have a dial-in number available to you. Uh, if you need it, you can just uh, contact our WebEx host and they can get that to you. Don't close your audio broadcast box and use the volume controls on um, your computer speakers to adjust the sound bar. For, if you have a question, and we welcome them, please submit your questions through the Q&A and we'll get to them at most likely at the end of the webinar. We have quite a bit of content to get through. If you need technical support, you can call our global services team at the 800 number or contact our WebEx assist through the Q&A. <clears throat> I wanted to introduce you first to today's speakers. We have uh, my colleague and uh, friend, Barry Asen, who's the president of Staffing Industry Analyst. He's been here for about 14 years. He is the co-author of Breaking Through. The book we'll actually be discussing today that talks about the five leadership disciplines. He has overall responsibility for the company's strategy, operations, and growth, and is a leading authority on the staffing industry. Prior to SIA, Barry was a global staffing leader at ADECO and held operations management positions with PepsiCo. He began his professional career with Anderson Consulting, the predecessor of Accenture. I also want to welcome Adam Stern, the Senior Director and General Manager for Advance. Adam has overall P&L responsibility for the business and works to set the strategic direction and vision of the company. In the spirit of this webinar, in terms of leadership disciplines, I'd like to share one of his favorite quotes. The essence of competitiveness is liberated when we make people believe that what they think and do is important and then get out of their way while they do it. That's from Jack Welch. I really like that, Adam. Adam was formerly the Vice President of Corporate Development at CRS, a human resource outsourcing firm, and a financial analyst on Wall Street at Credit Suisse First Boston. He has been with Advance Partners since 2002. He started at Advance as the Chief Operating Officer and has served as Senior Director and General Manager since 2015. Both of the gentlemen speaking today hold MBAs from Harvard University. Jeannie Michal Mihai Lidis is the Director of Client and Corporate Engagement for Advance Partners. She could not be here today, but I would be remiss in my duties if I did not introduce her. She's a critical part of the advanced team and brings over 20 years of marketing and public relations experience. She has 10 years at advanced partners. She focuses on creative solutions for staffing firm diversification and growth. Jeannie's not only forward thinking and strategic, she has the vision to pull together people and ideas to create opportunities that would otherwise be overlooked. Her focus at advance is on engaging key st stakeholder relationships and creative solutions for staffing firm diversification and growth. So with that, you can see that we have a, a good panel of experts. I'm gonna turn it over to Adam Stern. Adam? Great, thanks very much, Adrian, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we just wanted to spend a few minutes talking a little bit more about advanced partners and why this particular topic makes sense for us. Um, so to, to build on the, the background that Adrian has given you, um, Advanced Partners, we focus on achievable growth for independently owned staffing firms. And we do that by offering payroll funding and other working capital solutions, as well as back office outsourcing and strategic support. Um, to give you a little further background, we have about 500 independent staffing firm clients who in total will bill about two and a half billion dollars this year. And that client base of ours is spread all over the United States and some in Canada. And they're really in all manner of staffing, all verticals, healthcare, industrial, IT, and you know, everything in between. Uh, our clients range in size from startups to really some folks doing certainly well north of 100 and even well north of two or 300 million. 
the sweet spot for us, the typical client, is somewhere between five and fifty million dollars a year in billing. Uh, and, and I mentioned those statistics just to give you an idea. We've been doing this for 20 years now, and it really gives us kind of an interesting perch and perspective on staffing, independent staffing entrepreneurs, and kind of what works and what doesn't work. I should also mention uh, here at the bottom of the slide, we are part of the Paychex family. So as I'm sure you're aware, Paychex is the um, leading provider of payroll, HR, and insurance services for all small businesses across the United States. And we here at Advance, we are the platform that focuses on the staffing industry. As we uh, move on to the, to the next slide, you know, the question we always ask ourselves is how can we help? How can we truly be, as our name says, partners to our clients? We consider ourselves problem solvers, and what we like most is to work with our clients who really are focused on growth. So as, as most of you on this call, I'm sure, are aware, growth does create problems. Um, now, we believe these are good problems to have, but as you grow your staffing business, there is no question that you will have back office and infrastructure uh, challenges and scalability needs and you will likely have working capital challenges um, as well. So that's where we come in is we like to solve problems and truly partner with our clients and come up with creative solutions. Um, we are definitely seasoned veterans. As I mentioned, we've been doing this for 20 years with many staffing entrepreneurs. And uh, it was really exciting for us to partner with SAA on this uh, webinar as well as to sponsor their um, fastest growing uh, staffing firm research as that you know, very much fits in with who we are. Um, and so finally, before I turn it over to Barry, on the next slide, uh, again, I'm speaking for Jeannie here. So as Adrian mentioned, uh, Jeannie has a really interesting role. So with our 500 clients, and we've got about 150 people um, in our company that work on supporting these high-growth staffing entrepreneurial companies, Jeannie is in charge of a team whose sole role is to engage with our clients and understand their, quite honestly, their growth challenges and their growth opportunities. So um, that is Jeannie and her team's role, and that really, we think, is what sets us apart in our industry. And we wanted to really understand, and as we learned about this project and this book that Barry uh, was putting together about five disciplines of leadership, you know, we said to ourselves, why is this important? Um, and the truth of the matter is it's incredibly important because our goal is to help our clients grow, whether they're at $2 million trying to get to $4 million, or they're at 100 million trying to get to 200, we want to know how we can help. Um, we have several clients every year, uh, and, and have again this year, many clients who make the fastest growing list, and we started to ask ourselves, why? Why are certain clients um, able to hit those milestones and able to grow, and certain one, other ones uh, find those challenges? And it's, as it turns out, Barry was kind of researching and working on the same issues, so we thought this was perfect. Um, to partner. And the last point I'll leave you with is our mission statement as a company is, in fact, to help staffing firms grow. It's always been our mission for 20 years, and it's our mission today. So we're super excited to be a part of this. And without further ado, I want to pass this over to Barry so we can all have an interesting discussion about how we can uh, uh, make these staffing firms grow even faster and even stronger. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Adam. Barry? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you to Advanced Partners uh, for, uh, for working with us on this webinar. I'm uh, excited to be here and uh, really excited to talk about this topic. So as, uh, as uh, has been mentioned already, uh, this is all comes out of some research that we've been doing uh, between uh, staffing industry analysts and uh, with uh, my colleague Mike Cleland at uh, Charted Path. And we've been working on a, a book that uh, we're, we're calling Breaking Through, and it's about uh, the leadership disciplines from top-performing staffing firms. And as, uh, as folks mentioned here, you know, it really it came out of this question of why is it so hard to grow? Why is it so hard uh, to, to reach the top of uh, staffing industry performance? Uh, there are 19,000 staffing firms in the United States by our count. That's a lot of companies, but if you take a look at how they stack up by revenue, uh, once you get above about 10 million, uh, there, it's a, quite a small number. You know, there's only uh, not, uh, less than a thousand who are between 10 and 25 million, and uh, a small handful, around uh, 600 or so, who uh, make it over uh, 25 million, and only 140 firms who. Uh, who are on our list of $100 million 
uh, staffing firm. And so the question we started with was, uh, what is it, uh, why is it so hard to do that? And in particular, um, we, uh, we've looked at to try to, to get some answers to that. Uh, we started looking at uh, the fastest growing U.S. staffing firm. And we've been doing this for, uh, for quite a long time. I'm uh, really pleased to have uh, advanced partners uh, sponsoring the fastest growing uh, research that we're doing uh, this year. And um, we've, so what we looked at as part of the research uh, between uh, SIA and Charted Path was to look at what are the, some of the companies who are perennial members of that uh, fastest growing staffing firm list. And it's not just uh, perennial members of this, but companies who have also gone from startup to standout, companies who have gone from zero uh, to 50 to 100 million and been through that journey. What is it about them? Uh, so doing this, uh, obviously, we, we see a lot of different uh, uh, staffing firms over time, some who are, uh, who are very successful, others who have struggled. Uh, and we spent some time interviewing around a dozen firms who have uh, been perennial members of the fastest growing staffing firms list. Uh, the companies we talked to had average uh, organic growth over the past five years of about 21%. Uh, the market over that time has been growing in the single digit, uh, uh, sort of high single digit. So growing still at, uh, at, a, at a pretty significant scale that many of these are at right now, over 100 million. Uh, still outperforming uh, the market. So taking all that, combining with our research and consulting for experience, uh, to focus on what do high-performing firms have in common. So I think that um, there's a typical story that, uh, that companies uh, that go through, and this, this shows what I would call the phases of growth. And uh, on the left-hand uh, vertical axis is uh, the growth tra trajectory. Uh, you might think of this as uh, the revenue or the size or the scale of the company, but not, not explicitly that. And then on the, the bottom scale is the maturity of the leadership. And we've seen again and again that companies have uh, pretty typical uh, stages that they go through uh, as they seek to grow. And the first uh, we call the owner-operator dependent stage. And uh, this is where the executive, the founder of the company, is directly involved in production. Uh, they have growth, but it's, uh, it might not be diversified. In a lot of ways, uh, it's unsustainable and limited by executive bandwidth. The, the way to know if you're in the owner-operator dependent stage is uh, if you look around the office and you look at the, you know, the, the owner of the company or the chief executive, if they can't take a day off, without having uh, production slow down or being on the phone the whole time talking to their team in the office, uh, that might, that's a good sign that you might be in that owner-operator dependent stage. And the fact of the matter is the vast majority of these 19,000 staffing firms uh, that are out there never really get much beyond that owner-operator stage. Uh, we call the next stage independent operation, and this is where uh, companies start to have uh, line-level management hired. There's uh, beginning levels of delegation of day-to-day -day operations. And by the end of this stage, companies will, will get to a point where they're, they're operating a branch that's largely self-sufficient. Uh, the owner doesn't need to be there every day. The uh, operation can run on its own. There's a little bit of time to start thinking about uh, bigger strategy type uh, uh, questions. So that, that's a, a stage that uh, the vast majority of staffing firms are, are in, but the few that manage to get past that stage find that uh, at some point they reach a peak of what they're able to do in that independent operation stage. Those who really are able to grow are able to do what we call organic scale, and the idea here is that starting to develop re repeatable turnkey operations in multiple markets, I think the classic example here is independent operation would typically be a one-branch business. Uh, organic scale would start to indicate that you've opened and you've been able to be successful in multiple markets, multiple branch locations, doing the same business. And then finally, for those few who, who get to uh, a higher level, 
uh, they're able to start uh, doing what we call strategic expansion, the idea of looking uh, beyond perhaps the core business into new and adjacent uh, markets. Now, not every company goes through these phases. Some do them in slightly different orders, but what we've seen is this is a fairly typical pattern for uh, staffing companies. And the problem comes that there's barriers to getting from one stage to the next. There's pretty common uh, barriers. And that's really what we looked for in the, uh, in the research that we've been doing, is what's in common among those staffing firms that uh, have been able to break through the barriers uh, to growth. So we pose, uh, after uh, interviewing with, uh, uh, with many of the leaders who have been, who've been on this journey and able to do it, what we really found were, were five things that we felt were uh, disciplines that uh, successful staffing firms who have been able to break through the barriers to growth, to go from zero to 50 or 100 million or more, uh, had, uh, had in common. Uh, not every company, of course, exhibits them in exactly uh, the, uh, the same level and the same amount. Uh, there are different ways to skin the cat, as it were. It's not, uh, there's only one prescription. But we do think that uh, these are uh, five useful disciplines to, uh, to think about. And we arrange these here uh, from what I would call more strategic to tactical and uh, from left to right, the idea being that each of these sort of builds on each other. If you don't have the building blocks, uh, the, if you don't have commitment, uh, it's hard to get to the next, uh, the next one. And so the five disciplines that we lay out, and I'm going to walk through these here, are uh, commitment, uh, direction, a performance-driven culture, a, a discipline of talent development, and execution. And I think that many people jump immediately to execution. How is it we're running our operations? Uh, what's our comp plans? How are we managing our recruiters? All of that critical discipline for sure to success, but you've got to have these other building blocks here uh, in place in order uh, to, uh, to really be successful. So let's walk through and talk a little bit more about what do we mean by each of these disciplines. The first is commitment. And what we're really thinking about here is a commitment to growth and a commitment to, uh, to building a substantial business. Uh, and that commitment uh, really starts at the top. And this is, this is really about the leader of the business or the leadership team of the business asking the question, why? why? Why are we in business? What are we trying to accomplish? The fact of the matter is, uh, of the 19,000 staffing firms in, in the U.S., many and a significant uh, chunk of those that don't grow, the reason they don't grow is they really don't want to grow. Uh, the, it, and by the way, that's perfectly okay. Uh, you know, the, you would call that a lifestyle business. Uh, oftentimes people who really enjoy the work, are passionate and committed to the work that they do, uh, like, to, uh, like to operate in the business, and, uh, but don't really have a commitment to want to grow. What we found among the people that we're talking to uh, here who have really grown their business is they knew from the start that they wanted to build a substantial business, and that was really their why, was you know, for whatever reason it was, they wanted a substantial business. Companies that, that are happy to have a lifestyle business, that's totally fine. The risk, of course, always is that if you don't grow uh, and you're not uh, continually changing and innovating, the world outside is not standing still. So there's a risk to grow. And of course, there's also a risk of just uh, of standing still. What we found among many of these uh, organizations uh, was a, a willingness to uh, sacrifice, to make financial sacrifices, to make professional sacrifices, to make personal sacrifices in their business, constantly looking to, uh, you know, to reinvest and to advance, uh, to put their resources into the uh, advancement of the organization and the growth of the business. The executives also found a way to move from everyday working in the business uh, to working on the business. And I think that's a key distinction. Uh, many people in this industry really like doing the work. It's rewarding work. You're helping put people to work. It's great and important work to do. But you need to find a way, if you want to grow, to 
step back and figure out what you need to change in your business in order to, uh, to achieve some growth. And so I think that's really a, really a critical point is this idea of working uh, in the business, doing the day-to-day -day tactical work, and working on the business. And we have a little poll here. I'm just uh, curious if we can open the, the poll up right now. I'd like your feedback here. If you look at the leadership team of your organization, if it's you or if uh, others in your organization, you know, how much of your time do you think uh, the leadership team is actually spending on working on the business? And by that I mean planning the future, uh, working on the strategy, thinking to the next step and the steps beyond, as opposed to just the working in the business is the day-to-day, -day, the, uh, the tactical, and the, the putting out all the fires. And we know there, there are, in a high customer service business like that, this, there, there's lots of fires. So um, if, we can, uh, if we can just take another five seconds or so, and uh, folks uh, fill out the poll, and then uh, if we can close that uh, off, so it looks like the, uh, the not surprising results here, we can share this uh, publicly, is, you know, it's a 32%, uh, so about a third say that, uh, you know, it's a small amount of time, uh, under 25% of leadership's time uh, spent on working on the business. That's probably a good, you know, a sign that your business is, you know, what I would call more of an owner-operator uh, business, or, or maybe you're at the, the stages of independent operation. Uh, just 9% um, just of uh, uh, companies here on the line felt like, you know, the, the leadership team is really spending a significant amount of their time, uh, three-quarters to 100% to of their time, working on the future of their business. That's pretty common, I think, for, uh, uh, for staffing firms. So let's give a, um, a little idea here about uh, uh, some companies uh, that, uh, that we spoke to and uh, just some examples, I think, of uh, this commitment, this commitment to growth in action. And uh, a couple of the companies, one of them is uh, the Delta Companies, which was uh, founded in uh, 2001. Uh, Jeff Bowling is the uh, CEO in the healthcare and locum tenens business. Uh, they've made it to $115 million by 2016, perennial member of our fastest growing list. And if you, if you talk to Jeff, and when we talked to him, he, he talked about this moment, if you think about commitment to growth, where they bought the company back from their original investor, and they actually had this, uh, this sort of, he would call it a credit card moment, where they brought the leadership team together, and people, the, the business up to that point had been a lifestyle business, and the moment came when they bought this business back, they didn't have uh, they didn't have really anything in the business other than just the people there. People put their credit cards down on the table and were all in to grow that business. And that was the moment, Jeff will tell you, that uh, they really changed from a, a lifestyle business to a business with a strong commitment of growth, where he realized the responsibility he had to deliver the career opportunities to the people in the organization, uh, that their personal finances were at stake, and that uh, you know this needed uh, to be a, a serious, uh, some serious sacrifices made. Uh, and one of the sacrifices that companies typically make will be, you know, how much cash is the owner taking out? How much is going back into hiring those next, uh, uh, those next uh, recruiters? But uh, classic examples there uh, at the, at the Delta companies. Uh, Dan Campbell over at uh, Higher Dynamics, a different way of showing uh, commitment to growth. And uh, Dan has been a big uh, proponent uh, of, uh, of really sort of continuous learning and continuous investment in the learning and development of the organization. And uh, early on, has started an outside advisory board to sort of help him with knowing what he didn't know and to have an outside of the organization perspective. Uh, and really a lifelong focus in that business on continuous learning. Uh, the other example would give you is uh, strategic staffing solutions in IT, uh, grown to $320 million from a startup by uh, Cindy Paskey in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, Cindy will tell you that their, their ambition was always to punch above their weight. You know, from the very beginning, as a $10 million company, they started to behave like a $50 million or $100 million company. And, uh, you know, doing things big 
uh, going and making the investments uh, to grow. And constantly, all of them, I think, in, the, in this example, uh, constantly reinvesting in the business and a real commitment to, uh, to have it be something uh, substantial. So that's the first discipline we call uh, commitment. The next discipline is uh, direction. And what this really is about is uh, direction and strategic alignment. Uh, the idea being here that, yes, you can be committed to growth, but what are you going to do? How are you going to set your company up to be successful? And that starts with the very basics of, uh, of competitive strategy. I think for a lot of small firms, the, uh, the competitive strategy of their business maybe got thought through a little bit at the startup, but oftentimes it's uh, folks who have been in working in uh, a larger company perhaps who have gone off on their own, and their competitive strategy is just, you know, the strategy that the, the company I used to work for, uh, but we'll be better at it. Uh, but I think it's really critical that organizations spend some time uh, developing a defensible competitive market strategy that gives you an opportunity uh, to grow. You know, there, there's um, – Dan Campbell tells the story of uh, – he had uh, Guy Milner, who was one of the founders of Norell, who, who, who let him know about uh, this idea that, you know, never underestimate the value of a good tailwind. Uh, the fact of the matter is that you, the strategic choices you make for your business uh, have a significant influence on the prospects for growth. Our fastest growing companies list uh, uh, perennially the last decade has been filled with companies in the healthcare staffing space and the, the IT staffing space. So, you know, the choices you make, it's not that it's not possible to grow in other businesses. Lots of people have done it. But, um, you know, the strategy that you choose just in that one dimension, for instance, will, ha will have an impact on how easy it is and how quickly you might be able to go. Uh, also along with that is to build well-aligned uh, operational capabilities. You, one thing to have your strategy. The companies here we talked to were really good at figuring out how do we have an operation that actually will deliver on that strategy with the right resources uh, to make that happen. And then the ability to assess in an ongoing manner and adapt to that. So just to say a quick uh, little bit about uh, competitive and market strategy, uh, this is really the choice of customers uh, and market niche that a business chooses to serve uh, and how you differentiate from your customers. So just to give a, an example, there's a lot of different ways to do this. I think many folks in the industry you know, decide, well, I'm in the IT business or I'm in the industrial business. It's, it's by skill, uh, certainly also by geography. You know, we're going to be in the Atlanta market or in Detroit or, or somewhere else, or maybe we're going to be national in scope, depending on that. But there's other ways to think about it. Uh, some firms have been uh, explicitly focused on an industry, uh, very common in oil and gas or government or education or solving a particular situation or a problem, or even uh, types of size of customers. Are you going to serve small and mid-sized businesses? Are you going to serve very large customers uh, or not? So, you know, a couple of uh, things there I mentioned previously about this idea of picking the right market, of, uh, you know, certainly IT or healthcare has been a great place to be. Uh, but it's all, also important to mention that I, I think, you know, as critical about strategy is, uh, what you say, yes, we're going to do, it's also just as critical about uh, being able to say no. Uh, Dan Campbell of Higher Dynamics will tell you that they really accelerated their growth when they decided to just focus in the industrial space. They sold off their pharma business and a couple other things that were distracting. And those were all opportunities they could have done, but uh, strategy is a lot about what you what you say I'm not going to do, what we're going to focus on instead of being really great at one thing or two things or a small handful of things. And uh, I think that's a big uh, component of this. Uh, also to talk about, uh, so to talk a little bit more about uh, operational capabilities aligning with strategy, you know, I think the, the first is that uh, set your sales strategy has got to allow you to uh, identify and influence the right buyers. So if you've got a strategy to um, 
you know, to serve VMS clients, large uh, corporations, then you probably need to have a sales team that's developed on influencing MSPs, on working, you know, working your way into these large companies. Uh, you know, on the other hand, if you're going after small businesses, then you obviously need a sales organization that's built uh, to really penetrate a local market. Uh, the delivery capabilities um, have to match the success factors there, and uh, sales and delivery have to be able to scale and, and go hand in hand. Now, one of the key things about uh, uh, operational capabilities, uh, we like to break this down into sort of three key resources. You know, companies that are successful have this right alignment. You know, among the resources that you need are the money to be successful, the technology to be successful, and the the people to be successful. Now, Adam, you know, I know you guys you guys talk to a lot of uh, uh, companies. Obviously, your your uh, one of your core focuses is around the whole finance element. Wondering if you could just comment for a second on you know what what you typically see companies struggling with on the uh, on the finance side. Sure, and it's and it's a great point, and absolutely is germane to who we are and why we exist in this, in this whole ecosystem. As I think everyone is probably aware, unless you're really just starting out in this business, um, temporary staffing is a negative cash cycle business. In, in, in fact, it's probably, if not the most, one of the most textbook examples of a business that the more you grow, you will need capital. The only cost of goods sold in a staffing business is paying people. And those temporary employees, in most cases, want to be paid every week or every other week. Certainly, consulting and SOW may be a little different. But generally, you are paying your contractors regularly and quickly, and you are paid by your customer as a vendor. And if you're lucky, that's 30 days, and it could be 40, 60, 80 days. So it is, by definition, a negative cash cycle business, and particularly, as most of you on this phone either are or are aspiring to be relatively rapid growers, uh, the more you grow, the more acute that need becomes. And as Barry and I have talked about and uh, Mike several times, the other challenge is that traditional sources, uh, the, the most traditional and the most low-cost sources for working capital generally are looking for attributes and assets that staffing firms don't have. So the banker down the street really wants hard assets, inventory, equipment, real estate, raw materials. We don't have any of that in our staffing world. So that working capital piece is difficult. There's also could be, as uh, Barry pointed out a little bit earlier, there's an investment capital piece, meaning hiring more people. If you want to take on a large account, you may need more or specialized recruiters or sales or client service folks that you have to pay them right away even while the account is building or possibly you know, isn't even guaranteed. So there's no question that one of the key resources of a growing staffing firm is you have to have some sort of access to capital and you know, either offline or in a different forum, we have several um, ways we can talk to you about what are the ways to, to, um, to um, identify and to secure that capital, whether it's borrowing, especially finance, equity infusion. There are a lot of ways to solve it, um, but it is something to think about. And then, of course, I'll, I'll pass it back to, to Barry to talk about technology and people and your back office support. That's another thing that uh, is acute in a growing staffing firm. You have to make sure you've built those internal processes to scale, payroll, billing, all the HR components, insurance. These are all pieces of the puzzle that need to scale. Um, even if as an owner you're really good at recruiting and, and or you're really good at sales, there are these other pieces that you also have to spend some time on. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And uh, so as uh, folks can see, we put up a little poll here just to, you know, uh, interested in people's opinion on, you know, what's, what's the biggest limiting factor to the growth of, uh, of your company? I guess we could have had an answer here, all of the above, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the question here was uh, money and finance, which Adam talked about, uh, technology, you know, we hear that all the time from uh, organizations need to uh, just adapt to a rapidly changing world of technology, and then people, the uh, having the right people in the right place at the right time, uh, and uh, maybe you've got some other factor that's limiting your growth here. And uh, it'd be interesting, uh, interesting to see. So let's uh, show up the uh, the results of the poll here. 
And it looks like uh, by the, a wide stretch. By a wide stretch, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd, I'd say that uh, the you know 58% say that uh, people is the biggest uh, limiting uh, factor, uh, and then you know the second behind that is money and finance. Uh, with uh, none of the above, be interested to hear if some of you submit through the question bar what you think. Uh, uh, those of you who answered none of the above, uh, you know, submit that to us. I'd, I'd be interested to hear, uh, and then uh, technology as well. So let's. Um, I think that's an interesting perspective. Let's move on now, and I think it's good that uh, you know it's not surprising to me that uh, people said people as the first uh, thing, and we're going to get into that in the, uh, in the. Uh, staffing uh, uh, in just a second, talking about those uh, disciplines. Just wanted to close out on the uh, uh, the discipline of uh, direction to say that it's important to be uh, uh, assessing and adapting. You know, this is not a once and done thing. Figuring out your strategy and the direction for your business, and it should be a constant uh, reevaluation of that. The companies that uh, that we spoke to, they all had a crisis moment at some point where they had to reevaluate, uh, you know, did they have the right business model? Did they have the right uh, strategic focus? Did they have the right resource alignment? It's never, a, it's never just done. It's constantly uh, looking at this. So let's move on next to our, uh, our next uh, discipline. We talked about, you know, having a commitment to growth, having a direction and strategic alignment between your uh, strategy and the resources that you bring to bear to that strategy. Uh, the next thing that we saw that was, was quite common between these fast-going firms is what, what we would call a performance-driven culture. And uh, there's uh, Peter Drucker, who is one of the great uh, uh, management theorists, uh, has been often uh, attributed uh, this quote, although I think it's, uh, it's a little bit apocryphal. I'm not sure he exactly said it this way. But uh, his quote was that culture eats strategy for breakfast and organization structure for lunch. And I think this is the idea that uh, strategy is, is, is critical, um, but even more critical is having a great culture. That will help you solve a lot of problems. Now there's a whole, we could do a whole webinar just on culture and uh, you know, what is culture and how do you, uh, how do you define it. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll offer you a few things. Um, you know, what, one of the things I, I would say about a performance-driven culture is that, you know, there is no one answer to, to the right culture for a business, but it's certainly important that uh, culture is aligned with strategy and that the companies that are successful drive that culture and embody it from the top of the organization. It's not the sort of thing where, uh, you know, there is a one-page a mission statement and a little document about values that gets handed out to everybody, and uh, suddenly, voila, there's your culture. Uh, the folks who drove this uh, have really lived the culture, and uh, you know, in the things big and small. And uh, importantly, I think it's by design. Uh, a lot of companies have a culture that just sort of happened, and in some ways, you know, if there's a leadership vacuum. Uh, the culture tends to become the culture of, you know, whichever employees are the loudest or the most uh, respected or the most influential or sometimes just to have been there the longest. So uh, the companies that have done a great job of breaking through the barriers to growth have a real performance-driven culture uh, in place. When you walk into there, you can really see that there's a shared belief system, they've got cohesive teams, and very critically, uh, to grow a business, it's, it's one thing if the, the owner and the core leadership team has got a, a strong culture, but you've got to be able to transmit that culture to the next generation. And that's what we talk about is delegating cultural leadership, this idea of building uh, people up in the organization uh, who uh, can become the, the next generation of leaders in the organization. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment, but also to say uh, uh, that you know one way to think about culture and one of the most powerful messages uh, around culture is is the very you know it's not always what you say, it's what you do, and you know there are no more, more no more powerful messages about what you do than who you hire, uh, who gets fired, and for what behavior, 
and who gets promoted and how do they behave. That, those send powerful messages to the organization around uh, culture. So just to talk a little bit about uh, delegating cultural leadership, you know, the companies that have, uh, have shown some substantial growth here, I think one of the things they've done is they transitioned from a personality to a value-driven culture. They've had strong leadership at the start, but there's got to be something more than that that people can latch on to. The, the sort of like, here's how we do things, here's what we stand for, here's absolute things that are inviolable that you cannot do in this organization, here's absolute things that you must do. Uh, what is good behavior? What is bad behavior? Uh, and hiring and empowering leaders to become cultural advocates. Mark Eldridge of ALCU, an IT uh, staffing firm that uh, we spent some time with, had an amazing growth story over a really short period of time. And uh, Mark's, uh, one of Mark's saying, and he, he has many of them, is uh, we have a saying that the acquisition of power is about the relinquishing of control. And this idea that to be a powerful organization, you need to, it can't just be all about the leader or the, the top couple of leaders. You need to be building the next generation of cultural leadership in your organization. A couple other examples of uh, strong culture, and we saw strong cultures uh, throughout all the companies that, uh, that we talked to. Uh, but here's one, uh, Medix, which is in uh, the healthcare and health IT space. Uh, Andrew Lamoris, uh, founded in 2001, now $160 million in uh, revenue in 2016. Uh, they're, they're highly values and purpose driven. Uh, Andrew has a, a great sort of family story of how they found, founded his company and this idea of uh, really having no option but to go forward and to grow this business. But, uh, but a real sort of uh, family values for the people in the organization. They have the saying, medics, we've got your back, and really showing up for people in good times and bad. Uh, no matter what problem people are having or customers are having, going that extra mile to solve those problems for, uh, uh, for people. And Andrew even tells the, the story of, you know, the, it's, it's what you say no to is having vendors or partners or even customers who didn't sit with the culture and, you know, the decisions to fire them, to fire the customer or to fire the vendor because they weren't embodying the medics culture. And I think that's, uh, you know, the culture and the values. That's a, a great example. Another company, uh, Cindy Paskey's organization, uh, Strategic Staffing Solutions that I talked about earlier, a very high culture-driven organization. Uh, you know, their, their saying is their co corporate color is green. They'll tell you all green all the time. Uh, Cindy was at our executive forum, and she's got, you know, she's got part of her hair dyed green. Cindy takes this very seriously. Uh, and the people at, uh, at Strategic Staffing Solutions, I think, you know, incredibly high loyalty there, and they realize that not everybody, that everybody fits. And I think, you know, that's an important realization. You, the people have to be right for the organization. Um, the organization has to be right uh, for the people. Uh, and they're very big focused on, uh, based in Detroit, and really focused on building up the community there. So different approaches to culture, there is no one way, but having a culture that focuses on performance, that's culture by design, is really a, a critical thing. All right, so to talk next about uh, 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 discipline. This is probably my uh, my favorite discipline. Is uh, or in some ways the most interesting is uh, talent development. And what are we talking about in terms of talent development? Uh, I would say you know this is about hiring, but it's not just about hiring. It's about evaluation. It's about training and development and motivation of your uh, of your staff. There are some amazing examples of that in the. Uh, uh, the staffing industry. Perhaps the most sort of iconic example is the current market leader in the United States. Uh, the Allegis Group is a $10 billion company. Uh, they, you know, they still show up on our fastest growing staffing firm. It's hard to grow at 20, 30, 40 percent a year when you're uh, uh, when you're a $10 billion company. But Allegis uh, still makes the the list on uh, uh, in various years and. Um, you know, they, they will tell you 
that a lot of what they're about is talent development, how to grow that next generation of leaders, and how to, uh, you know, almost all of the growth that Allegis has had has been organic. Almost all of the growth has come from hiring people right out of school, training them, in inculcating them into the culture and the operating systems of the business, and then developing that talent to take on the next level of leadership. Rarely do they go outside for, uh, for hiring. And in fact, they've spawned a number of uh, some of the most successful companies in the, uh, uh, in the industry. Uh, Insight Global, which is now a billion dollar company, all the folks there came out of Allegis. Apex Systems, which is now part of On Assignment, uh, the people who r ran that were uh, uh, trained and raised uh, within uh, within the Allegis group. So an amazing story there, with a photo, uh, you know, a real focus on um, developing the talent and hiring the talent. And you know, in this business, uh, we saw that a majority of you said, you know, the biggest constraint to growth is people, and I, I think that's absolutely true. Mark Eldridge over at Alcu, I think you know, summed it up quite succinctly. He was always looking to hire. You know, when is the right time to hire a salesperson or a recruiter? Those people are revenue generating for a staffing firm. And his answer to that was whenever you found the right person. And I think that's a different mindset than a lot of people have. It's, you know, it's really what can we afford in the budget, what can we not? You know, it ties back into this whole uh, question of some of the sacrifices you might need to make, the funding and the financing that you need in your organization to uh, you know, to hire that next recruiter, but that's, you know, the, uh, with Alcu, the, you know, to go over 100 million and since 2008, a lot of it was about that, the hiring, the training, uh, and the development of, uh, of people uh, from the ground up. All right, so just, you know, I, not touching maybe in detail enough on, uh, on each of these disciplines. We could, uh, you know, we could do sort of deep dives on, <clears throat> on each of these. But I'll come to the, uh, the last discipline that we had, which is the discipline of execution. And as I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, this is critical, but a lot of folks um, sort of go there first into how they're going to chart their growth. We believe you've got to have these other disciplines in place first, but execution is all about executing in sales and recruiting. Uh, it's about identifying essential practices, scaling those key processes, uh, and then being able to replicate that over multiple operations. That's a very easy thing to say, three little bullet points on the slide, very hard thing to do. So. Um, but that's all about, you know, having an operating system, having uh, standard practices, knowing what works. The companies that were great at growing, um, you know, they're able to sort of cookie cutter and move from one operation to the next, opening new business units, developing new, uh, new leaders. They've got a playbook to, uh, you know, to execute on. They're not making it up so that the new office or the new uh, business unit is operating with some, uh, you know, some different processes and procedures, but they've, you know, they've got the playbook uh, to really execute on that. Um, at, at Alcu, for instance, you know, one of the disciplines in execution is everybody's making 100 calls a day, and there's really no getting around that. That's a standard that, uh, uh, you know, that they would have, and um, uh, I think that's an example of the types of uh, uh, things that, that are, um, uh, you know, reinforced throughout organizations or, or not, but the fast-growing ones know what those key things that they have are and uh, reinforce them. So those are our, our five, uh, five disciplines from, uh, I think I've given you sort of an overview of these different disciplines, uh, commitment to growth, a direction and strategic alignment, having a performance-driven culture, talent development, and execution. I, I'm curious to see uh, uh, the, our final poll of the day here is, uh, is this one. Is, so you, you've sort of gotten a sense of these, and I'm curious to see, you know, what's, for those of you on the line, what, is, uh, what do you think is your company's biggest challenge today? Uh, is it commitment uh, to growth? You know, is it just 
that the, the folks at the top are just not, are they committed or are, are they not committed to, uh, uh, you know, to really growing? Um, and and the, that's, you know, a lot around the why. Why are they in the business? Uh, is it the strategy and the direction and having the resources? Is it the culture of the organization, uh, the, the development of talent in the organization, or is it execution? So um, if everybody could just uh, answer those, and let's see if we've got, uh, if we've got some results. Uh, your, your gut reaction to where the big challenge is for, uh, for you. It's all about the people, it looks like. <laughs> well, it's uh, so well, if, if we've got that up on the, uh, the screen there, and you can see that, it looks like we had about a third said talent development. 32% uh, said that, but 20% uh, said uh, direction and, you know, the, uh, the strategy and the alignment of resources, uh, the culture, performance-driven culture uh, was, uh, was also in that next spot, followed by execution. And, um, you know, uh, only a small amount said, uh, uh, you know, the commitment to growth. But, uh, uh, you know, I think some folks will recognize that and that will, uh, will resonate. So uh, we're we're going to open it up now for uh, for some questions. Adam and I are uh, are on the line, and uh, we uh, we can take your questions. I think we've got uh, we've got some um, some questions that have come in over time. Uh, we're happy to stay on for uh, for a bit and answer as many as we can get to. Uh, first question somebody had is uh, you know I showed the. Uh, uh, the revenue amounts, or I, we showed this sort of stages of growth, and somebody asked about what are the revenue amounts on the phases of growth. And I think, you know, we very deliberately, um, uh, Mike Cleland and I, didn't we didn't put uh, revenue lines on there. I think, you know, typically it's, you don't see very many owner-operator businesses more than 10 million or so where the the owner can't get out of the office. Uh, but but there is no hard and fast. Um, sort of bury, you know, there is no hard and fast level that when you're at some, you know, 10 million, you're, you're in one level or another. And that's, that's why we didn't uh, uh, put that uh, uh, there. Uh, we got another question. Uh, so an, another, uh, another question that we had come in is uh, somebody asked, uh, we started an office two years ago in our, in our profitable. How do I take the next step and open a second office and uh, and continue to grow, a Adam. You, you might I might kick that over to you to uh, um, you know your 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 answer to that. Obviously, you guys see lots of uh, uh, small companies who have one office and are are looking to get to this stage. Sure, uh, I'm happy to talk about that. And this is something we see all the time. So for our clients who do operate in, if you will, sort of a retail kind of space where physical office is sort of the, um, or one of the keys to, to expansion. We see that all the time, and without question, that second office, um, it's a big hurdle, right? So because in the one office, it kind of gets back to your point, Gary, about working on the business versus working in the business. At one office, that owner or owners can really have their hand in everything. They can be assisting in the recruiting, in the job filling, in the sales piece, in the client support piece. Once you have that second office, you know, physics come into play. You can only be in one place at one time. So the ability um, and I should say the necessity to delegate and to have some level of um, systematized processes so people know what their job is to be doing and don't need direction, that's really a big difference. So one of the key things that we have found is the folks who su successfully cross that bridge to having more than one location, they have one key right-hand person. Um, it is important that because they can't do everything. So it doesn't necessarily mean that that right-hand person, that he or she runs the other office necessarily, but someone that can take the ball and run with the sales component or someone that can take the ball and run with recruiting or someone that can take the ball with what we sometimes like to just call everything else, onboarding, HR, payroll, billing, sort of the operational aspect. So I think the key, if this, this question this person is asking, how do I kind of take the next step? I think part of it is identifying who is the number two and how you can divide and conquer a little bit. Yeah, Adam, I think that's great. And I, I came, you know, 
that same thing, we saw this again and again in the companies that we talked to. When they talked about how they grew, I think for a lot of companies, uh, you know, you, you're going to go off, open an office in another city, and the, the move is you go look and find a branch manager in that city and, and bring them in. The, the, the companies that we've seen uh, more consistently, they've done that occasionally, but much more consistently, they've grown their own people and found people to move to these locations. And, you know, if or brought people in, but, but you know, with the explicit idea that you would spend six months or a year in the, in the core location and then move and take the culture and the operating methods to that n new location. It's very hard to open a new location and, you know, if you're a small company and don't have really well-defined processes, bring some new person in to do that. Uh, so that was that was sort of an aha for me, uh, and I think you know Adam, you're right on this idea of uh, of finding that strong number two. It's uh, you know that's a, that's a key moment when you know it's not possible for the owner operator then to be there at every moment, and so you want somebody who's going to be a cultural ambassador. Uh, you know if you've got the right culture, right, you've got to have that in place in your one operation to be able to bring that to the next. So we had right. another uh, we had another question here. Uh, somebody asked about you know are there books or uh, places that uh, you can get help with this? I, I guess I didn't mention this. The uh, the book breaking through. We're actually working on on this right now. Mike and I are uh, we're in the sort of final stages of this. The book will be out at the end of this year, um, and so you know stay tuned for those of you interested in sort of all the details. I think we only touch on sort of a high level of that uh, in this webinar. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have details for folks on how you can get your hands on the book. And we're going to be talking at next year's uh, executive forum at the uh, Fountain Blue in Miami in uh, February. Not a, a bad thing to do. And uh, we'll be, uh, we've got a number of sessions that uh, we're going to really dive into things we talked about here uh, in, in the book. So let's see. Uh, we've got a, a few other uh, questions. Yep. Somebody uh, uh, Adam, I don't know if you have one that. Uh, that yeah, you've Barry, got. I was, I was, uh, Barry, we'll look at the, the feed of questions as well. A couple I can sort of hit quickly. So, uh, one that's certainly near and dear to our part is someone is asking whether a healthcare staffing funny, a company, or for that matter, any staffing company, has to be a certain size or revenue to seek an outside funding source. Absolutely not. Uh, companies like ourselves here at Advance and Paychecks or others. Um, are, are happy to work with uh, small companies whose, whose needs are still more modest or much larger ones where the, where the working capital need uh, raises into the fives and tens of millions. Um, so absolutely there's no minimum there. But the other one that's, um, the other strategic question that I see posed here that I think is important is someone's asking whether or not the virtual office um, can be successful versus having bricks and mortar. And I think that comes back a little bit, um, if I want to put it in the, the bucket of one of Barry, Barry's um, disciplines uh, has to do with um, kind of understanding direction and what kind of staffing business you want to be in and what vertical market. So what I would say there is certain types of staffing we have found people to be more successful either with a brick and mortar or sometimes an on-site. So typically some of the lower paid, higher churn, industrial, um, lesser skilled work you're going to want, to want and in some cases need to do in-person interviewing and you're going to need to be, for instance, in a location, sometimes on a bus line or where transportation is easy. Whereas if you're over on the other end of the spectrum where people are making, you know, $100 an hour and these might be highly skilled, perhaps technical sorts of employees, certainly in the white collar bucket, less blue or gray, then absolutely we have seen cases where a virtual model can work. By doing that, you can contain costs. You can build some of that consistency in your um, sourcing, in your qualification of candidates. But you certainly see a lot of that in companies that are uh, providing um, contractors under MSP work. Um, you see a lot of the, the virtualized or centralized recruiting. I will say, I don't know, Barry, if you've seen this, sometimes that's one of these things where the pendulum goes back and forth. And, right. and perhaps now maybe starting to see the beginnings of going back to local um, presence. Um, but the long, that was a very long-winded way of saying it depends on what kind of staffing you're doing. Yeah, I, I think that's great. Now, you know, I, I mean, we, we do think that with a lot of the evolution in the, uh, in the business, and somebody else asked a question here about, you know, the MSP model and that's impact. 
on uh, staffing companies and where that's all going. Um, you know, we, we think that the more and more the pressure is going to be on staffing firms to come up with new operating models. Uh, you know, all the companies that we talked to didn't really have sort of a virtual model, but I think going into the future, uh, that, you know, being able to do that, way, do that allows you to get, you know, a wider talent pool. And, um, and, and in a lot of ways, it's, I think, in, you know, if you, particularly if you're playing in this lot, high volume, low margin MSP type of business, uh, you know, it, it's a necessity. You've seen many of the big companies uh, going, in, going in that direction. Okay. Well, guys, we have run out of time. We have some great questions. I think what we'll do is um, I'll make sure that Barry and Adam get these questions and we will reply to you outside of the webinar. Um, Adam, did you want to talk to us a little bit about um, the resources that Advance has available? Sure. You know, I don't want to take too much of anyone's time, but again, we really appreciate um, uh, everyone spending some time with us and having this, this exciting discussion. Um, as you see here, we've got a website at advancedpartners.com, the backslash SA webinar. We've got several resources there, not only the slides. Someone did ask about the slides. Uh, that will be available through SIA. That will be yeah. available through SIA. At this site here, we have several um, uh, resources available, all having to do with how one grows a staffing firm. There's some white papers and blogs and a uh, previous webinar that we had done as well. So Great. please visit us there. You can learn more about what we do. And again, lots of resources available, whether you're a current client of Advance or not. Uh, we just love to talk about uh, how to grow a staffing firm. So please contact us or visit us online. Thank you. And we'll be sending out a follow-up email with um, not only this webinar, but the webinar that uh, Advance had uh, partnered with us on before in the follow-up email to all the registrants. Uh, we'll have our next uh, Staffing Industry Analyst webinar will be on September 19th at 10 a.m. Pacific, so mark your calendars. And for those of you who'd like to see your name in print, we're looking for contributions from thought leaders for our staffing stream. Uh, email uh, Subhadra, uh, her email is right there for you. And with that, I want to thank everyone for uh, their participation and thank Barry and Adam uh, for their thoughts on this topic, and I think we've all learned a lot. Thank you, and uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank, thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you all for spending some time with us, and uh, we'll try to get uh, offline answers to, to folks' Absolutely. questions as well. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.